Anna Marshak Dietrich is the Chief Operating Officer for Terrafusia. Impossible should be removed from the dictionary, according to, to Anna and her philosophy. She and her husband, Carl, are founders of Terrafusia and developers of the transition. The transition is a rotable, light, sport aircraft, or some of us like to call it a flying car. Now think back to the Jetsons, those of you who are old enough and you know they could fly or they could drive in their vehicle. It's happening now. Please help me welcome Anna Dietrich. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you, WAI, for having me here this morning. It's an honor and a pleasure to be talking with you. Uh, we started working on Terrafugia five years ago uh, to help realize the dream of making personal aviation more accessible and safer for private pilots like ourselves. In the process, we've created what, as Peggy said, and the media loves to call it, the first practical flying car. Uh, actually, the transition is really more of a street legal airplane or an airplane that drives. But instead of just talking about the plane, I wanted to show you some footage of our proof of concept aircraft. And uh, then we'll, we'll go through some pictures that document the last five years and how we went from that initial idea to where we are today. Would you roll the video, please? <laughs> up to somebody's driveway and unfold the wings and have an airplane in their driving and then wonder how it got there. The truth is, uh, until the vehicle flies, you know, 75% of your risk is that first flight. We flew, yes! That was gorgeous. What do you think of that, huh? That looked beautiful from up here, I tell you. <laughs> We're gonna go fantastic. Good. We have fantastic. Oh, that was the most beautiful little flight I've ever seen. A Woburn company has unveiled the world's first flying car. Move over, Jetsons, the ultimate fix to rush hour traffic. Tonight, the car we all dreamed about as kids is a reality. The Terra Fugia transition, and it could be coming to a skyway near you. We've got a steering wheel for driving, a gas pedal, a brake pedal. Then for flying, we've got a control stick, rudder pedals. Look at that. You know what? I got to tell you something. That's pretty cool. As you can see, the first flight of the transition got an awful lot of international media attention, but certainly didn't start out in the spotlight like that. Let me take us all back to uh, the summer of 2005 when myself and a few of my friends from grad school at MIT started thinking about the transition and about how we could make life as private pilots a little bit better for all of us. If we can go to the pictures. So this is Sam Schweier in the blue and my now husband Carl Dietrich, though not at the time, uh, in the gray. 
And this is our first chalkboard sketch of the transition on a classroom at MIT uh, while we were actually still in graduate school. And uh, Sam kept coming by Carl's office and saying, so when are we going to start our company? <laughs> and I had known the both of them from a different student group, actually, in the Aero Astro department. And uh, they knew that I was the kind of girl that could get a bunch of engineers and whip them into shape and keep them on a schedule. <laughs> and <laughs> so they very wisely, in my opinion, uh, when they started actually getting serious about looking into the feasibility of starting a company, asked me if I would help them with this. So I said yes. And uh, one of the first things that we did was build a series of wind tunnel models. Uh, we were working in the MIT student shop at this point on nights and weekends in the basement. Um, we actually built two iterations of the early concept for the transition. And uh, these wind tunnel tests, this is actually our second model in the wind tunnel here. Uh, these wind tunnel tests were the first, cy uh, first cycles of the design build test process that we're still going through today. And the first flight that you saw is part of that. Uh, we continued with some subscale remote control model testing, uh, again using our MIT connections to get some really skilled remote control pilots to, to build and fly this for us to test out some of the dynamics of the aircraft. And while we got uh, the information that we needed and it actually performed pretty well, I'm, I'm eternally grateful that our full-scale flight testing went a lot better than this initial remote controlled flight testing that we did outside of Boston at a, an old airstrip up there. It's a lot of fun, but lots of little pieces when it crashes. <laughs> In parallel with the first engineering efforts, we were also working to make sure the company itself was feasible. Uh, as many of you are aware, a great idea in two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. So we had to make sure that we had something feasible behind us on the corporate side as well as on the engineering side. Our initial validation of that uh, business side of the company came with us being uh, runners up in the MIT 100K Entrepreneurship Competition. This is a fairly prestigious competition and we were up against your really traditional startups like software and Bio biotech and Web 2.0, and getting that validation from a national panel of venture capitalists and entrepreneurs was really the encouragement we needed to pursue the company and incorporate and really start to try to make a go of this. That also came with a cash prize, as you can see, which never hurts. So we took that money and some money that Carl had won for a different prize that spring and took our company to Oshkosh for the first summer. So this is uh, us in our van at Oshkosh for the first summer. Uh, we had a rental van with a plywood box and that wind tunnel model you saw earlier in it strapped to the roof of, of, the, of the rented van, which, by the way, didn't have a roof rack. Um, so that was exciting. <laughs> but we made it, and we were there with friends and family and founders, and it was an incredible experience for all of us. And we got the next really key part of the validation that we needed about whether or not this was a good idea, which was we got our first customers and our first third-party investors at the show that summer. So the momentum really kept building for us. Uh, this was the summer of 2006. We came home from Oshkosh very excited, very energized, and very aware that we now had an awful lot of work to do because people had said that they wanted one of these and had actually given us money to get one of these. So now we actually had to go from the design and the concept to actual hardware. Um, we wanted to do it as quickly as possible. The first mechanical challenge that we took on were those automated folding wings. That's one of the newer things about what we're doing with the transition as opposed to some of the historical attempts at combining flying and driving into one vehicle. Is not being able to get, not having to get out of the cockpit to unfold or fold up your wings is a key bit of our convenience and, and value proposition with the transition. So this is Sam and Carl hooking up uh, the first prototype folding wing that we ever built. And uh, the wing worked perfectly. We broke the stand. We cycled it so many times. But the wing, in fact, is still, is still working today. So with the, the wing testing successfully behind us, we went on to molds and plugs. One of the plugs that we built by hand with a mold that we made off of it. And uh, from those molds and plugs, we made uh, prepreg carbon fiber composite parts. We actually built our own oven to cure them at temperature. And uh, this is the uh, bottom half of the plane, the empennage, and the top half of the plane, the fuselage, uh, being fitted together in our shop outside of Boston. So you'd raise and lower the fuselage, trimming a little bit more each time to make sure that you had a good fit there. Once those pieces were fit together and we had the suspension and the powertrain installed, we went out and did some early drive testing. We're also used to getting into a car and just having it work that a lot of, a lot of the times we don't think about how much of an engineering masterpiece those vehicles really are. And it turns out that getting something to drive comfortably and stably on the road at high speed is actually just as hard, if not harder, than getting something to fly comfortably and stably in the air. So we started very early in the process. You can see we don't have the doors, we don't have the wings, uh, working on that drive handling. We actually were fortunate enough to be able to use one of our local airports for that drive testing and some of the low-speed taxi testing, which you see here. 
The taxi testing was great. Uh, the uh, controller at the airport we were using, which is uh, Lawrence Municipal outside of Boston, was just fantastic. And one of my things that I'll never forget about this whole process is we were doing some braking tests on Taxiway Echo at the airport. And incoming traffic was on the way in, and the controller said, oh, and watch out for the flying car on Taxiway Echo. <laughs> Dead silence. <laughs> By uh, November of 2008, we had gotten basically all we needed to get out of that low-speed drive-in flight test, or excuse me, drive-in uh, taxi testing. So it was time to move on to the next step. It was time to increase the speed and see what we would be able to do at, at higher speed. So to do that, we needed to go somewhere else with more space. So we went up to Plattsburgh International Airport in Plattsburgh, New York, on the coast of Lake Champlain. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous country up there, and absolutely frigid in December. So you can see here, this is us looking out from the hangar that we rented up there. And uh, just snow and, and winter light and this beautiful place. Um, fortunately, it did stop snowing just long enough for us to get in a few days of testing. So this is, uh, we had a, a camera crew documenting the process. And this is one of our high-speed taxi testing runs at Plattsburgh. Unfortunately, um, well, unfortunately for me, because I was really hoping, rather unrealistically, that we would actually get it in the air by the end of 2008, was not to be. Uh, the data collection was going well, but we got a lot of snow and ended up going home for the holidays with a laptop full of data, but without that first flight that I was really, at this point, getting excited for. Uh, this is our test pilot, Phil Mentier, taxiing back on one of our snow out days at, at first trip. So let me skip ahead now to March 5th of 2009. This is a year ago next week, and I actually uh, came back from the conference last year in Atlanta, I flew into Boston Logan, uh, my husband Carl picked me up and we drove straight up to Plattsburgh from the airport to do this testing deployment. So this was right on the heels of the conference last year. I was terribly excited about the conference and then got terribly excited about our testing program and it was just an amazing couple of weeks. Um, but this is one of our early morning uh, test runs uh, early in that first, or early in that, it was actually our third trip at Plattsburgh. And now this picture is one that I've never showed anybody, so you're very special. This is us getting our, ca our caffeine uh, and uh, flight plans in order for the day in the briefing room at Plattsburgh on March 5th. It was well before civil twilight. I had uh, drug everybody out of bed very, very early, and I think they've forgiven me, but I'm not sure. Um, but here we were. We were trying to beat some winds that were supposed to come up later in the day. And uh, we got the plane prepped, uh, briefed, and out of the hangar before the sun had even started to come up. So this was a very early morning. Um, but it looks like it, it, it worked. We were making the final presentations just as it was starting to be civil twilight, and they're starting to be legal and day VFR. While the rest of the team was getting in position around the airport, we operate our flight tests with several different stations. We have a chase truck that follows the aircraft on the runway. We have a chase plane that follows the aircraft in the air. We have a weather station, a data station, and uh, I'm actually up in uh, what's now an abandoned control tower, not acting as a controller, but doing traffic spotting and coordinating our own activities on the airport as well as doing some data collection from up there. And as you can see, even inside that enclosed space, it was very cold. And <laughs> one of the things that, just to illustrate how, how cold Plattsburgh is in the winter, if you haven't been there, we had to strap hand warmer packs onto the batteries of our handheld radios to make them last longer than five minutes while we were testing. So, um, But it, was, it all ended up being very, very worth it, as you'll see in a few minutes here. So this is me up in the tower. We started the morning with some high-speed taxi test runs that were very similar to what we had been doing in the past. We were trying to get our team in the groove, get the airplane in the groove, make sure everything was functioning the way it had been for us in the past and that we were, we were good to try uh, creeping up on first flight. And we wanted to be very, very careful that we snuck up on first flight and that first flight didn't sneak up on us, which is a very important distinction <laughs> for uh, doing high-speed taxi testing. And the way we were doing that was the, because the aircraft is designed for use on the highway as well as flight, you can actually trim the, the plane to be stable on the ground at up to about 90 miles an hour. So we had been doing our previous high-speed taxi testing with the plane trimmed for highway configuration, so giving some extra downforce to keep it out of the air. So this was the morning when we were going to be changing those trim settings. So a few degrees at a time, we were increasing, going from uh, road trim to flight trim. And we had done a lot of modeling, but we weren't sure exactly where that, that line was going to be. So this was something that we were, uh, each run was just a little bit more likely that it would get off, but we weren't sure which one it was going to be on. So this is one of the runs when it didn't take off, taken from our chase plane. And it just gives you a sense of the airport. You can see our truck. You can see the proof of concept. You can see the, the weather station at the windsock. And you can see Lake Champlain in the background. 
About 7.05 that morning, we held for some landing traffic. It was, you know, it was an active airport, and it's not a, a busy airport, but it's an active airport. And we had, by this point, gotten to be pretty good friends with the folks at the FBO and uh, knew a lot of the pilots who flew in there regularly, uh, freight routes and passenger flights and things like that. And uh, this time, we were, we were holding for, for this uh, guy landing, and he uh, came on the radio, and he goes, that's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And while all of us are trying to figure out what we say to him, <laughs> and you know, finish laughing. The FBO comes on the line and explains to him the whole thing and uh, tries to sell him one. <laughs> and it was great, because we just, we just didn't have to do anything. And uh, um, so we, he, got, he uh, got a good chuckle on, on Unicom, and when he got over to his hangar, he signed off and said, good luck. And I guess that was the last little bit that we needed, because the very next run was our first flight. So this was snapped from the uh, weather station uh, at midfield. We actually ran two weather stations because the, the runway was so long that ASOS was different than the midfield. So we had our own weather station at midfield, and they took this as the first picture of it in the air. And um, this is sort of the iconic picture that uh, the media picked up. This was taken from our chase plane. And as you can see, in a lot of ways, this first flight really wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't even a full wingspan off the runway. Um, straight and level, up, back, down. Um, I was more nervous about the first landing than about the first flight. Fortunately, that went very well also. And our test pilot actually said later that it was remarkably unremarkable. And in a lot of ways, that's not only the best compliment you can get from a test pilot, but very true. It was just one step in this de design build test cycle that we had been doing for years at this point. Um, but at the same time, it was, it was everything. You saw how excited we were. Um, it was truly phenomenal to see something that I had actually helped build uh, both literally and figuratively from the company perspective, fly. And I would very strongly encourage you that if you ever have the opportunity to do something like that, take it. Um, it will be harder than you think it's going to, um, but it will also be much more rewarding than you could ever imagine. So I would encourage you to take that chance if you do have it. Um, this first flight was also the answer to a question that uh, I've alluded to a number of times in, in various things, but it was the most common question we got asked at the beginning, which was, you know that's impossible, right? Well, I, if I thought it was impossible, I wouldn't be wasting my time. You know, let's, you know, let's get real here. But that's something that I hope that now that we've done this, I, I don't get that question nearly so often. Um, and I hope that people can look at this and, and maybe think twice before using that word impossible about their own innovation or someone else's, because that's how you do new things, is by deciding that the impossible really isn't, in fact, so impossible and just giving it a, a good shot. So speaking of the future, and, and innovation. Now, what's next for Terra Fugia? Well, following that first flight of the proof of concept, we did a total of 28 flights and a very basic test program for that uh, initial vehicle and folded all of those lessons learned into the redesign of our production vehicle. The proof of concept was always just sort of a quick and dirty get it in the air and learn some things airplane. So we're just about done now with the more refined design of our next generation transition, uh, which will be, if not exactly the production design, very close to it. We hope to be releasing what that's going to look like this summer at Oshkosh, so stay tuned for that. Um, and then from that point, we have uh, the rest of this year to build that, that next plane, do some drive testing, and maybe, just maybe, fingers crossed, about this time next year, I'll be running off from the next WIA conference to go do flight testing in Plattsburgh again. So there's still an awful lot to do before I can step back and feel like we've actually accomplished what we set out to do. But I have confidence that with the team that we've got and with the support from wonderful organizations like yourselves, that we will be able to get there the same way that we got here, which is really just one thing at a time. So thank you very much.